wants to give you an extremely brief overview of data science, big data, and the way I thought about doing that is really just to cover um, the vocabulary that is currently used in the industry and then to tell you some stories about uh, what people are really doing in the real world practically with large amounts of data. Uh, and I do believe we'll have time for discussion or questions or I'll be here throughout the talk if you want to chat with me later. Um, I'm happy to do that. And if anyone's tweeting here, I'm change me some an email. Um, so big data has, uh, has been called the new oil. The data revolution is the new industrial revolution. Um, data is tyranny. Data is the you know going to change medicine. Like the the coverage and sentiment around data has ranged um, from one extreme to the other, um, and it hasn't necessarily been borne out by what people are actually doing. Um, we're at a, a point now where we can do things with data that were just simply not possible to even think about five years ago. But the reason that that's true is not. Um, because of any real fundamental shift. It's not like we discovered a new law of physics. Um, it's just because it became cheaper to keep data than to throw it away. Um, and that was a very simple technical change that has actually led to a huge amount of potential for the work that we all do. Uh, and just to take on the term big data straight head on, uh, it's not my favorite term. And one reason why is that many people think big data no longer fits in Excel. Um, and I know that earlier versions of Excel actually had a, a line limit at 65,000 rows or so, and I know newer ones can handle millions of rows. Um, but the point that people are getting at is that it, it's data that will no longer fit on one computer. And this is a technical definition that people in the industry are, are pretty happy with. Your data is big when you re are required to buy or build a specialized infrastructure in order to do even simple things like count it. Um, counting is non-trivial. And that's a good technical definition, but it leaves us with the problem of the fact that as technology improves over time, our definition of big data is itself moving over time. Because I can fit data and memory on my laptop, which is in my bag over here, that I could not have imagined doing uh, four years ago. So I use a different definition of data, which is that big data is useful data. Um, and what I mean by that is that we have the tools and capacities to ask the question of our data and get the answer back before we've forgotten why we asked that question in the first place. And so the real innovation in big data is a human innovation. It's the ability of a person to ask a question, find an answer, and to play with data in a creative way that just hasn't been possible before. Uh, and this is happening now for a few reasons. Um, one reason is the data itself. We are aggregating it. A company like Bitly is being built on the data exhaust of an otherwise normal behavior pattern. Uh, when we have data, we actually have affordable computation. So I spoke at a conference about a month and a half ago called Science Online for Teens. And it was a, a conference for um, getting young people, particularly young women, interested in pursuing science careers. And I met a young woman there who was graduating from high school this year and planning to go off to school to study computer science. And she had been using her allowance money to spin up a cluster of machines in Amazon's compute cloud to sequence her own DNA, which is awesome. Um, and she had managed to get the, the DNA, the raw data, for about $500 from a service that she spit in a tube and like mailed it off to a lab, and they sent her back uh, the raw data. Right? And so here's a high school student, and granted a very uncommon high school student, who was able to do something that cost billions of dollars only 20 years ago uh, as her science fair project. And that's completely amazing. Um, and the last reason that this is possible is we, we know how to work with data. Um, the field of computer science and uh, the larger field of data science has made huge progress in the last 15 years. In, understanding how to robustly work with data once we have it, in knowing what the, the appropriate statistical measures are, and in building tools that make it possible for somebody to go on the web and learn how to do this kind of analysis. So the skills you need to do very good data analysis are much more attainable now than they've ever been before. So all of these th things combine to this, which is um, my favorite representation of the, the data scientist. 
uh, which is a career that, um, whether you love this name or not, it's not that people in these jobs are doing anything that people haven't done before for many years. Um, it's that we have a bunch of capabilities combined in one professional that really haven't been combined that way before. And the skills fall roughly into three groups. Um, they are the mathematical skills to build models that represent in a simple way some form of messy reality that you might observe in your data. They are the engineering and the technical skills to implement those models in a way where they can actually run on data. And they are the social science skills to appropriately contextualize data or to get someone to explain to you the problem they're trying to solve to do an analysis and then to communicate it back to that person who is not involved in the analysis such that they, they can then make a much better decision off of their data. So we've had these people for a very long time. <laughs> um, I'm proud we have these ones now. Um, so most data scientists come from an academic background. Um, and again, all they're really doing is developing the skill set to take something that looks like this and produce something that looks like that. Uh, and it, it is a lot of fun. So I wanted to tell you a few stories of people actually practicing data science. Um, the first one is from my team um, at Bitly. We're a social media analytics company. And we have a system that tells you on any given day what people around the world are paying attention to you. And so this morning, this is the top story in Ghana. This is the top story in Italy. And this is the top story in Brooklyn. New York, um, and of course it actually is about Bushwick Restaurant Week. Um, but it's just this way of learning from an aggregate trend something about uh, the, the typical behavior in that location. Another company I really adore is called Forecast.io, and if you have an iPhone, they have an app called Dark Sky. So especially on a day like today, you need to get this app or, or open up this web page. They take the US government public weather data, your GPS location from your smartphone, and they make a micro weather forecast based on where you are standing right now. So it will tell you things like, it is going to start raining in 10 minutes and will rain for 15 minutes. It is amazing. Um, and this is another, this is Mike Flowers. He looks really red in this picture. He's speaking at Data Gotham, which is a data conference here in New York last September. Um, he is New York City's chief analytics officer, and his team, uh, which is a small team of engineers and statisticians, have done a couple of projects that are pretty remarkable. Um, the first one, they actually, think, so his job before this was preventing organized crime, and it turns out that preventing organized crime and studying the city statistically are sort of the same job, if you really think about that. Um, so they went and took all the data they had on registered grease collection pickups and found the restaurants that were not uh, paying for their grease to be collected and were indeed dumping it in the sewers. And they were able to figure it out uh, just from looking at reported sewage incidents and the registrations. And instead of going into these restaurants and finding them, he found an alternative energy company that wanted to buy that grease brought them into the restaurants with him and said, look, don't dump this in the city's sewers. That's not good for any of us. Let these guys buy your grease. It'll solve your problem. It'll solve our problem. And everybody wins. Um, and in another uh, example, he uh, it turns out New York City operates 300 ambulances. And they each live in a fire precinct. And one lives in the firehouse. And the others roam about the city waiting for a call to come in. And so they looked at the data where the distribution of calls were, and they found that the ambulances were not sitting anywhere near the optimal point for those calls. Uh, so that instead of just telling the ambulance drivers what to do, they went and asked them why they were sitting where they sit. And the answer was because ambulance drivers need food, coffee, and bathrooms 24 hours a day. And there was a restaurant that uh, they had a relationship with you know, in that location where they were waiting. So his team went and made new relationships with restaurants closer to the optimal points, and they cut down ambulance response times in Manhattan by almost a minute. Um, with a very simple piece of analysis put in the right context, working with people to make it a win. It's, uh, it's really cool. All right, so my last story, this is actually from a paper by Hal Varian, who is Google's chief economist. He has a really wonderful talk about um, predicting economic indicators with Google Trends. 
which you should watch because he starts it off by predicting hangovers with Google Trends, uh, which it turns out is easy to do if you have the data on when people search for vodka, which is Saturday, and when they search for hangovers, which is Sunday. Um, but then he goes on to explain this project where they were able to predict the, uh, in real time, the unemployment rate based on people's searches for how do I apply for unemployment. So they found in their data a leading indicator of uh, an economic indicator, and in their case, um, it is a prediction problem, though only economists would consider predicting what's happening now a prediction problem, as contemporaneous prediction from those aggregate behavior trends. So it tells you uh, what's happening now from the way people are behaving broadly. So the metaphor I like to use is that data gives us superpowers. Um, a more boring interpretation of this is that data is a hammer, and it is really the tool, uh, and you have to choose how to apply it most appropriately. Uh, and this is just the very, very beginning of the impact of data science on the world, on the products we use, and on the systems we build. Like, we're still really at the point where we are aggregating, counting, and then learning something amazing. Uh, and so I think the next few years are gonna be extremely exciting, and I think the work that 